said, at your table, why don't you all talk and come out and share with us at the end of the discussion of every sales dollar that comes into this restaurant, what do you think falls to the bottom line in terms of profit that can be returned to the owners or reinvested in the business? You know the least that was guessed at any table? 40 cents. Two tables guessed 70%. You know what the profit margin in a restaurant is? Any restaurant people here? If you can keep five cents, you're excited. Ten cents, you know, you're in ecstasy. And what blew the president's mind is the head chef said, let me see if I get this right. If we buy a steak for $6 and we sell it for $20 and our profit margin then is $1 and I burn a steak, we have to sell six steaks for no profit to make up for my wastage. He already had the thing figured out. But if people think you're making 40, 70 cents a dollar, do you think they care about food costs, labor costs, any other kinds of things? You got to involve your people because their jobs depend on you staying profitable and all, but they got to at least know what the deal is. And so I can't tell you enough in good and bad times, you got to look at your people as your business partners. <clears throat> the third thing that I think is really key is that you got to be servant leaders. And when I talk about servant leadership, a lot of people think I'm talking about the inmates running the prison or trying to please everybody or some kind of religious movement. They don't really understand leadership. See, there's two parts of servant leadership. One is strategic leadership, which is all about vision and direction. And the other is about operational leadership, which is all about implementation. Okay? The strategic leadership, which is, says, what business are we in? What's the picture of the future? What are our values? What are our goals? What are the initiatives that we're going to focus on this year? <clears throat> that's the leadership part of servant leadership. And that's very important because if people don't know where you're going, your leadership doesn't matter. I mean, Alice learned that in Alice in Wonderland. Remember when she came to the fork in the road and didn't know what to do and the fool Cheshire cat's sitting there and says, which road should I take? And he said, where are you going? She said, I don't know. He said, it doesn't matter. And so I want to tell you, if you don't do strategic leadership right, your leadership doesn't matter. But now the second part of servant leadership is operational leadership or implementation, which is, now how do we take the strategy, the vision, the values, the direction, initiative, and accomplish them and live according to them? And now what you've got to do is that the strategic part, the leadership part of servant leadership, that's the responsibility of the traditional hierarchy. It doesn't mean that you uh, don't involve other people, but people look to the hierarchy for direction and and vision, and where are we going, and all these kinds of things. And so that's their responsibility. And then you want, once you've done that, you want people to join your organization who will be responsive to the, to the strategy, to the vision, and the direction that you've set. Now, when it comes to operational leadership or implementation, now the traditional hierarchy doesn't work. What you have to do is philosophically turn it upside down so that now the leaders at the top who set the vision and direction and the strategy and all, they're at the bottom as head cheerleaders, supporters, encouragers, and who's at the top? The people closest to the customers. And this is the most tough thing for most organizations and the reason why they don't get much help from their customers or their people is they got big egos at the top of the organization and they want to keep the hierarchy alive and well for implementation, see? You want to make sure you know who's in charge and who is this and all. And so what happens is you have all the energy in the organization sucking up the hierarchy. If there's a conflict between a customer need and what your boss wants you to do, who wins? The boss. You're no idiot because they're evaluating you, so you better suck up the hierarchy. And what happens is that the customers now are left there in the middle of a duck pond. Wayne Dyer, the great personal growth guy years ago said, there's two kinds of people in life. There are ducks and there are eagles. And what do ducks do? They go quack, 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 quack. And what do the eagles do? They soar above the crowd. Okay, you can always tell an organization run by self-serving leaders because the hierarchy is alive and well because if you've got a problem with the customer, they go quack, quack, it's our policy. Quack, quack, I just work here. Quack, quack, I didn't make the freaking rules. Quack, quack, do you want to talk to my supervisor? Quack, 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 quack. 
and that's what they're doing. They're just quacking away uh, at you, and, uh, and that's a real problem where you can always tell when the organization's turned upside down because what are you doing? You're dealing with eagles who can soar above the crowd. They'll say, don't worry, I'll get back to you. I'll take care of it and all. They can bring their brains to work. Just to show you a couple of fun examples of, of this, uh, when I travel, I have this thing I put around my neck. I call it my geezer pouch, you know. As you get older, you forget things. And in my geezer pouch, I have my passport and I have my... Uh, license and my ticket and my itinerary and a pen and pencil and I go around the airport, you know, and, and all that, you know, and I got everything here. So one day I loaded my geezer pouch and I left it on my desk, see. And I'm pulling into the airport in San Diego <coughs> and I got no official identification. And I got to get on this plane. I don't have time to go back home. Fortunately, the first airlines I went to was Southwest Airlines. Now, the only book I've ever written that I got my picture on the front cover is I wrote one with Don Shula, the old Miami Dolphins coach. You know, they took our picture in Miami Stadium. So I ran into the bookstore at the airport, and luckily they had a copy, and I bought it. See? <clears throat> so this young guy from Southwest Airlines is checking my bag, uh, and he said, could I see your identification? I said, I feel badly. I don't have a license. I don't have a passport, but how's this? And I held the book up, and the guy looked at it, and he shouts out, this man knows Don Shula. He said, put him in first class. I mean, they don't have first class, but they're high-fiving me out in the street. You know, hey, man, that guy knows Shula, you know, and all this kind of thing, you know. And there's an older guy there, and he says, I know the security guard's upstairs. I think I can get you through there, which he did. Now, why is that so? Because that's the way Colleen Barrett, you know, Herb Keller, and now Gary Kelly have set the organization up. They what? They give power to the frontline people. Have you ever been in Southwest Lair? They're having fun. Why? Because one of their values is a fun-loving attitude. And if a, if a patient complains about that, like somebody wrote, uh, you know, Colleen a while back and said, you know, I'm offended by the humor and the kidding that goes on around talking about safety rules on your plane. Normal airlines would write back and say, I so appreciate your note. And I'll talk to our frontline people. And here's a couple of, you know, coupons to fly and all. You know, Colleen wrote back and said, goodbye. You know, <laughs> you know I guess you're not going to be flying with us anymore. You know, because that's their culture. And they put the power there. And they want to have fun uh, there. And so that's what you can expect there. Because they can make those kind of decisions on there. The next airline I had to go to uh, was... Uh, one of the ones that's always in financial trouble, talking about Chapter 11 and all. And I showed my book. This is before they could overnight my license to me. And, man, the duck doo-doo started to fly. I mean, oh, quack, you better go to the ticket counter. I'm like, quack, you know, you better talk to my supervisor. We call the supervisory duck the head mallard, you know, because they just quack at a higher level. Have you ever had some of them? And I tell you, within about 10 minutes, I'm talking to a guy in a suit and a tie. And I said, could you get a life, you know? I mean, you really think I superimposed my picture on this book to get by you? I mean, I got to go buy security to see if I got any weapons. You're just trying to check if I'm the same guy, you know? And man, he was angry, you know? He was a bureaucrat, so I said, man, I better change my strategy. So I sucked up. I went, oh, my God, it's such a difficult job you have making these kind of decisions, you know? And so he finally let me through, you know? But if I hadn't change my style. I'm dead, you know. And uh, so, uh, but that's, that's just what you see, you know. And, and, and when you set up servant leadership, then what? People are empowered. People can do things. Now, I'm going to give you one last example. I'm going to give you a government example, because most people think, oh, man, if you can put it off in the government. Well, the worst situation I've ever had with the government over the years, I don't know about you, is going to the Department of Motor Vehicles. Have you ever experienced that? I always thought they hired human beings that hated other people. And, uh, you know, they just beat you up in a really systematic way. And we live near Mexico, and the way they treat our, our good Mexican-American friends is just really amazing. Now, of course, you all know in California, we don't have to go there all the time. I don't know, what is it, every 10, 12 years you might have to take your written test. So, man, I kept away from there like, like the plague, but uh, I have problems forgetting things, but I lost my license, see. And I'm going on a big trip to Europe in two weeks, so I thought I'd better have a license to back up my passport, you know, because you never know what will 
what will happen. And uh, so I said to my secretary at that time, Dana, and I said, uh, could you schedule at least three hours next week at the Department of Motor Vehicles? Because that's about how long it takes them to beat you up. And um, so I went over there, and I walked in the front door, and I knew something had happened. Because this woman charged me, and she said, welcome to the Department of Motor Vehicles. Do you speak English or Spanish? I said English. She said, right over there. The guy behind the desk said, welcome to the Department of Motor Vehicles. How may I help you? It took me nine minutes to renew my license, including taking my picture. So I said to this woman taking my picture, what are you all smoking here? <laughs> you know, I mean, this isn't the apartment I used to know and love. Uh, and she said, haven't you met the new director? It's always a leader. It's always a leader. It's always a leader. And I said, where is this new director? And they had these, uh, you know, kind of shelves or not, you know, whatever, counters in the front and then counters going down the side. They welcomed you here. You took your pictures down here. Out behind the counters, no privacy at all is the desk. She said, there's the new director. No private office, no nothing. So I went out to meet this guy. And I said, what's your job as the director of the Department of Motor Vehicles? Write this down or put it on your forehead. It's a wonderful definition of a manager. He said, my job is to reorganize the department on a moment-to-moment -moment basis depending on citizen need. You know what he had done? He had cross-trained everybody in everybody's job so everybody could take pictures, everybody could run the front desk, including secretaries and bookkeepers in the back of the house who, if there was a run-on by citizens, he said, that's not mission critical. Get out here, the citizens out here. Nobody could go to lunch between 11.30 and 2. Why? That's when the citizens are free, see? And so this guy is really amazing. Now, just to show you how amazing it is, shortly after this, my secretary turned 50, and she decided that she was going to get one of those mopeds or one of those scooter deals, and she's going to bop around Southern California, see? So she gets this beauty, and she never even thought about a license. You know, she thought car license, you know, moped, you know. No, you've got to get a license. So she goes over to the Department of Motor Vehicles, <coughs> and she... Uh, gives her name to this woman behind the counter. <coughs> and she said, uh, and she looks at it, and Dana had never had a ticket in her life. Not one mark on her whole license. And this woman says, that's incredible, your record. And she said, I'm looking at it, though. In three months, you're supposed to come back to take your written uh, driver's license again. Why don't you take both tests today? Dana said, tests? I didn't know I was supposed to take a test. And she's panicked. I don't know if they were teaching these people human relations, but this woman reached across the counter, patted her hand. Oh, Dana, with your driving record, I'm sure you can pass this test. And besides, if you don't, you can always come back. So I want to tell you one of the interesting things before I tell you what happened is I recognize some of the people in this place, and they were people who used to beat citizens up. And now they're cheering them on. What do you think the difference is? Leadership. You know, vision, values, and all. So Dana goes over and takes the test, brings it back to this woman. She falls one correct answer short of passing both tests. So officially she fails. This woman says, oh, Dana, you are so close to passing. She said, let me try something. I'm going to re-ask you one of the questions you got wrong on each of the tests to see if upon thinking about it, you can get it right. Now, isn't that amazing? But what's really amazing is only two answers to each question. <laughs> she said, Dana, you chose B on this question. What do you think would be the right answer? A, you pass, you know. And so I was telling this story one time, and at the, at the break, a bureaucrat came up. And you can always spot the bureaucrats. They have really tight underwear on, you know, and they walk a little bit like this, you know. And this guy came, he says, why are you telling that story? That woman was breaking the law. Your secretary failed, you know. And so I went back to see my new friend. And I said, I told him the story. And he said, Ken, let me tell you one other thing. When push comes to shove around decision making, I want my people to use their judgment before rules, regulations, or laws. He said, the judgment of my person was, your secretary had a perfect driving record. And she didn't feel that was fair to that kind of citizen 
for one missed thing to bring them back.